Welcome to another museum FAQ video. I'm Paul Orselli, president and chief instigator at POW, Paul Orselli Workshop here on Long Island, as I'm sure you can tell by my background. <laughs> and uh, I'm super happy today to be joined by Matt Kirkman. How are you, Matt? I'm very well, thanks. Thanks okay. for having me today. Oh yeah, sure. Always nice to speak with you. And um, Matt, uh, as I'm sure you know, I always like to um, give folks, uh, guests here on the videos, a chance to tell us a little bit about their background, sort of how they ended up where they are today. So maybe if you can give us a, a little bit about your background and then we will launch into our main conversation. Yeah, I'll, I'll hit a few of the of the milestones. I guess I would start with my design degree. You know, my college design degree is in visual communication. And so I've always been very, very interested in um, the way that uh, graphic design, environmental graphic design um, uh, has uh, worked in the world. So that's what I set out to do. Um, I was lucky enough to get hired by the John G. Shedd Aquarium in Chicago uh, as an environmental graphic designer during the uh, Oceanarium construction project in the late 80s. That, so that was, even though I had other graphic design jobs prior to that, this, that's where I really got um, to work on truly environmental graphic design. Uh, and I guess you could say environmental with a capital E because it was spatial and dimensional and interesting materials like classic environmental graphic design, but it was also about the environment. So it was, you know, we, we um, set to interpret um, the animals in the oceanarium, the, the coastal Pacific Northwest habitat that those animals lived in. Uh, environmental stewardship and responsibility. Um, so it was, you know, it was really a life-changing experience for me. So um, as part of the team at the shed, uh, I got to uh, participate in a very team team approach of, of interpretive development and exhibition planning and design, um, right straight out of the, you know, I would call it the Chicago method, you know, thanks to Janet Kamian, who wrote so much and, um, um, advocated for a team approach where you pulled people from various departments. So I was pulled from the design department to work on the, the exhibitions in the, in the Oceanarium. And I worked alongside marine biologists and um, curators, animal husbandry people, um, educators, other designers, habitat designers, um, audiovisual people, and we together collaborated on the um, on the exhibition on, on the dry scope we called it because we were not responsible for for the the containment of the animals. But you know, so I I, I went to the um, you know the the what do they call it the you know the school of hard knocks or whatever. You know, I, I learned I learned the trade that I do now by being just so generously invited and and um, you know participating in a in a project like that. Um, I loved it so much that when the project was completed, I said, I want to do this again and again and again. And um, I felt I want to be our, our mutual friend, Carol Garfinkel. I want to be in Carol Garfinkel's shoes. I want to be an exhibit developer. Uh, and I want to take my design degree and um, shape it with a little bit more understanding of interpretive methodology and, and good writing and educational uh, and pedagogy. So I... Um, I went back to school, got a master's in education, in outdoor education, with an emphasis in interpretation and environmental education. And then I marketed myself. I wanted to be, I wanted to work for the National Park Service. I wanted to do exhibition design all across the country about, you know, the wonderful places that this country um, has. And um, I wound up, uh, that, that didn't pan out, <laughs> but, but I, um, during grad school, I, I became an interpretive naturalist at a prairie museum. So I was back in the museum um, field this time, you know, on the front line, working directly with tour groups and giving, giving uh, guided tours of the prairie. So I honed my interpretive skills um, while I was doing exhibits at the prairie museum as well. Um, I, and I eventually took a position with the Southern California Environmental Education and Leadership Foundation as the assistant director of the outdoor school there. And that kind of gave me, you know, another credential. Um, and then um, 
you know, design, I wanted to be a designer again, you know, so I kind of flip flopped, I, you know, that my, my trajectory would is a zigzag. This guy, this guy can't keep a job. No. I well, no, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to do, I wanted to do both of those things, but not every job opportunity allowed me to do both of those things. So I kind of zigzagged in and out of, of environmental education and outdoor education and design and eventually found the place where those two things would come together again, like they did at the shed. Um, and I found a design firm in the Boston, in Boston, um, that was doing lo and behold, they were on a course doing aquarium design and zoo design and nature center design. And so it was a perfect fit for me. And I brought, you know, all of those experiences kind of together, um, in a, in a, uh, you know, really powerful experience at a, at a design firm. So I, all of a sudden I was a consultant. I became a design consultant to, to museums and aquariums and zoos. And I did that work for many, many years um, until I felt like I could do it myself on my own. And that was nearly 20 years, nearly 20 years ago that I started yeah. off with the and the and the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, I know that was a little long winded, but as I said, you know, it's a little zigzaggy, and and it it just you know emphasizes these kind of you know this binocular vision that I have for environmental ed and the and the ne the necessity for it. And well, that's uh, that design. might be that might be a good segue into uh, at least the start of our main part of our conversation because uh, I think what you described in in terms of the zigzag you know several times um obviously the outdoors came up but also the sort of synthesis and integration of many different aspects um and it seems to me uh, as i know you and know your work for a number of years uh, a, a common thread might be this notion of uh, a sense of place, um, whether that's an outdoor sense of place or a historic sense of place. You work on many history projects and historic place mm -hmm. projects. So um, maybe the way to launch into the conversation or the conversational ball I can throw to you is, so, you know, what, what, it, what do you think about this notion of a sense of place as it relates to your work and your creative work with museums and cultural institutions. Yeah, you know, I think um, I think most most of my projects, most museum projects, I'm sure your clients as well are after, you know, trying to capture or or um, capitalize on their sense of place. You know, they try and define it and um, and. It is uh, this, you know, it's, it's a complex idea until you really start to think about it and deconstruct it a little bit. It's a nested idea, you know, a gallery can have a sense of place, a museum in its entirety can have a sense of place, a site can have a sense of place, even a city can have a sense of place. When you think of, you know, New Orleans, you know, you get, you, you can conjure up a sense of place or you think of Las Vegas, you can conjure up a yeah. sense of place. Chicago, Chicago Paris, yeah, yeah, anywhere. Exactly. And then think about a very, very specific um, uh, built space, you know, like being under the, under the cover of the Lincoln Memorial, you know, so, you know, just a powerful dramatic encounter like that. Um, so yeah, I, d I do think a lot about a uh, sense of place in the work that I do and helping uh, my clients either capture that and articulate, help help visitors articulate what that sense of place is, or you know acknowledge the sense of place that exists and plug into it in a, in a um, uh, respectful manner. So you know there are things that I feel um, generate a sense of place. You know, like like if you think of well, I, you know, I could think of my own shed aquarium there in Chicago or the Field Museum, Stanley Hall in the, in uh, Stanley Field Hall in, at the uh, Field Museum, you know, a sense of grand architectural space, grandeur, a sense of grandeur. So, you know, the Grand Canyon, you know, is grand in its name. So grandeur, I think, creates a sense of place, um, some kind of profound human expression. I know that you and I have been to the um, the city museum, it has a powerful sense of place when you 
um, not only just encountering the playful um, experiences there, but you know, learning who's behind it, and and you know, they make they do a good job to share the story of its creation, which actually generates an even more powerful sense of place. Or think of um, the Milwaukee Art Museum, you know, that has that you know gorgeous architectural expression from a creative individual. Or I, I recently worked with the um, the Wharton Escherich Museum in Pennsylvania, a furniture maker who who handcrafted every aspect of his home from the structure to the to the furniture to the cutting boards and 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 you know just absolutely every, to the handles on the silverware you know everything made by him out of wood so you know just the idea of profound human expression um, I would also think uh, authenticity comes to mind you know even when you're in a, a place like uh, John Muir Woods, or, or the, or the, you know, among the coastal redwoods, the, uh, you know, the, there's a intersection of grandeur and authenticity. Um, a garden under glass, like a conservatory. Well, it, it, it's, it strikes me then that um, maybe the, the notion of the term sense of place isn't quite. Uh, maybe expansive enough or inclusive enough for some of the kinds of things you're talking about, you know, like if you're in John Muir Woods or you're in a, a natural setting where it's not a human impact, but this still the, this natural surrounding the Grand Canyon is, is very impactful to you on a um, personal level, uh, uh, maybe even a spiritual level. So I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure if a sense of place is sufficient. I, <laughs> maybe I don't know if you well, have another term or, or, or another way that you think about it or an additional way that you think about it. Well, so, you know, what you're, what you're um, bringing to light here is, you know, when a, when a place, when a place comes to a design consultant and says, we want to interpret this place. Uh, we have to really think about the intersection of what is given. You know, the, I would say that the, the sense of place is kind of what is inherent in the, in, the, in the encounter, but the interpretive overlay um, becomes some, it's a human construct and that human construct or that story context. Um, you know, I was working with um, um, a few historic properties recently and we were doing some research around this idea of sense of place and what about the what about the human aspects what about the environmental history that that humans bring to the table and we discovered um, a term called spirit of place which uh, comes out of the uh, the UK which has that um, that human dimension applied to it. So, you know, um, we started to think about in the case of, I mentioned the Wharton Eshrick Museum or, or the House of the Seven Gables or, or Emily Dickinson's homestead. You know, what is the spirit, what is the spirit of these, of these places? Because there has been human occupancy, um, there are human stories that overlay uh, the given either natural or built environment so yeah i i like that a lot the the notion of spirit of place because um you can go to a place you know oftentimes a historical might think of the lewis armstrong house in queens uh -huh. in uh, new york city or um i had the good fortune it's not open yet but the coltrane house john coltrane and um his wife, Alice Coltrane, and I got to walk around the house. And at one point, they brought me into a room and we were overlooking, actually, a nature area, you know, that in this big picture window and looking out over this wetlands. And the, the person who was showing me around said, well, this, this is the room where John Coltrane wrote A Love Supreme, where he composed A Love Supreme. I was like, Wow, you you like you could charge <laughs> like you could charge musicians to just like stay in this room overnight or for you know because th there is there is a real the person's not alive obviously mm -hmm. but there's a sense of like huh now I know that composition a love supreme and I have my ideas about John Coltrane the musician but now I'm I'm standing in the place 
where he stood out looking at this natural, this sort of beautiful natural area. And this, this is the place where he composed, you know, arguably one of his masterworks. Yeah. And it's like, wow, that's really, I mean, it is a spirit of place. It's not just Absolutely. a physical yeah. place. And that, yeah, so I like about, that Yeah, term it's not about the wallpaper or the furnishings. Um, you could strip out that. As a matter of fact, you could strip out those furnishings. <laughs> well, actually, there's some very colorful shag rugs that are left <laughs> in different colors from the 1960s that, that were relate to chakras and Alice Coltrane. Yeah. So you wouldn't want to do that in that case. But <laughs> yeah, but think of like you know uh, I don't know if you've ever visited Graceland or you know these celebrity you know places where there's a sense of celebrity encounter. Um, jungle, you know, jungle, you know, the jungle room, baby. Worth the price totally. of admission uh, totally. in yeah, Graceland. Exactly. You're like, exactly. you're like, wow. Like you're like, yeah. Same thing. You go there and you think, huh? Like I'm imagining Elvis like kicking back in the jungle room. It's yeah. like, okay, now I need, now I need to stop my head from spinning for a second so I can go on with the rest of the tour. So admittedly, so. you know, the, articulating a spirit of place in words. It's a little bit of a slippery exercise. It's it's a it's, um, you know, it's akin to Beverly Sorrell's big idea for exhibitions. You know, you wanna you wanna lay it out. You know, subject, an active verb, and a consequence. You know, just like the big idea, you wanna capture this spirit of place. At least on the you know on um, the last set of projects that I have done that have had a strong sense of place. So I you know I recently did the. Um, the Welcome and Welcome and Education Center at, at Walden Pond, uh, as I mentioned, Emily Dickinson Museum. I'm working with a, a Pioneer Village here in Salem, and we're you know we're trying to uh, really articulate what is the spirit of this place in words, so that you know much like a much like a big idea serves to organize an exhibition. This spirit of place statement kind of hovers over the project and um, helps us make decisions. It helps, helps guide the interpretive planning or exhibition development process. Well, that actually makes me think of my next question because, okay, let, let's say we've got somebody, some, several somebodies watching this video, hopefully, at times, and uh, you know, they're like, ah, huh, yeah, sense of place, spirit of place, like, yeah, okay, I get that and I like that and I'd like to uh, look for those opportunities in the projects I'm working with and the clients I'm working with. So I'm wondering if you have any tips or any approaches, you know, that if you were coming, if you were coming to a brand new project and you know that this isn't you that this already is an important part of your working thing and you think you know no matter where no matter what the project is i think finding the spirit of the place and helping visitors find the spirit of the place is going to be important like where would you start as a designer you know like somebody watching this video who wants to inform their own practice and uh, you know really latch on to that yeah. notion of the spirit of a place like what what do you, what are you thinking about when you approach a project or when you're in the midst of a project to help help tease out that spirit of the place yeah yeah i think it um i think the spirit of place you know as i mentioned earlier it's something you want to articulate in words but i also think it is something that is almost self-generative as you get to know the project more and more so um I'm thinking of a historic house museum project that I worked on where we had multiple defining statements at play. We had a big idea for the exhibits. We had a period of significance that came from the furnishings and historic, you know, historic analysis of the property. So we had a, you know, we knew that it was um, of this time period. We knew that we wanted to communicate, have these communication aims as part of the interpretive um, experience for visitors. So the spirit of place came out as um, an articulation of this is what was going on in this house at the time of the 
period of significance. Um, and I'll just, you know, I'll just share, this is from um, uh, Emily Dickinson's Homestead. So we have a, we have a, um, a, a poet's home. She has a reputation for, for being reclusive. You know, people think maybe she never left the house. Um, uh, she's a bit of an odd bird. Um, all these various I identities at play, people coming with various assumptions of who Emily Dickinson was and who she is in the popular imagination, because um, she's alive and well, uh, you know, on on Apple TV and and in movies and you know all kinds of things. So my so, my wife's former high school classmate Cynthia Nixon. There you go. Played you go. <laughs> yes. played played there you her, go. So, so you know people bring these assumptions to to the Emily, Emily Dickinson homestead. So the spirit of place that we wanted to project was a place that's actually bustling, uh, bustling with, with family, with, you know, there's a, there are neighboring properties of, you know, it's a, it's actually a, a very active homestead. Um, and, and Ms. Dickinson is interacting with uh, domestic help with family members, with people in the town of Amherst. She's actually, uh, although, you know, she became a bit reclusive later in her life during, during the time period of her poetry generation, which gives her the celebrity status. Um, you know, she's actually a very busy and engaged person. So an engaged person in this place became, you know, what our, what the spirit that we wanted to capture. Well, that that's interesting. I mean, would you say like because what what I just took away from what you just said is you're sort of pushing up against people's assumptions, which might not be really good assumptions or the complete story. And so, I mean, is that is that a deliberate tool to look for to look for those sort of um, assumptions that people might come to. I mean, like even, I'm just thinking of a physical thing like the Grand Canyon. You know, if I've never been to the Grand Canyon, like what, I know the Grand Canyon, but do I really know the Grand Canyon? I know, I might know Emily Dickinson and some of her poetry, but do I really know Emily Dickinson? I mean, that's, anyway, that's what struck me. Well, when you know, you it's just funny, said I, I, I hadn't really thought of that, but, um... Um, where was I going with this? Oh, the, um, the, um, another spirit of place idea that I encountered through, it wasn't a project of mine, but through researching other sites, um, just North, North of Boston is, um, the Crane Estate. It's a, you know, it's a gorgeous mansion, you know, on the, on the, on the North shore and, um, um, it, you know, palatial, you know, it looks like it belongs in Newport, you know, it's that kind of place. And, um, it's administered by the trustees of reservations here in Massachusetts. And you'd expect to go to the Crane Estate and learn all about opulence and wealth and, um, privilege. Um, and lo and behold, you know, the Cranes, when they were, uh, when they resided there, um, they had these lavish parties on this back lawn that that rolled rolls down to the sea well you know we'll, we'll have to put a link with some photos in you know down below here so that you can appreciate what what this vista is like behind the crane estate this this rolling lawn down to the sea and they would have these you know croquet parties and and banquets and and music galas and all this kind of stuff so the um in order to turn that idea of opulence on its ear, the Crane Estate decided, well, let, you know, there's these parties didn't happen because the Crane family staged their party. Like when you and I have a party, we're slaving at the stove, you know, for 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 quite some the, time. The, the Cranes Before, have an army of servants to put on their parties for them. Absolute, <laughs> they had an absolute army of help, of domestic help, and. Um, so the idea of interpreting the Crane Estate all through the lens of you are a guest at the Crane Estate and being a guest is an extraordinary experience and it takes a whole lot of people in order to welcome you and make you feel comfortable and, and, and 
um, allow you to have a, a, a wonderful time. Well, that so, that's that I was going to say that's interesting. That's sort of like the old um, masterpiece theater British series upstairs, downstairs, you know, right, where you, you, right, and, right. and I mean that uh, obviously for any big opulent estate or someone who has a huge house. Yeah, they're not they're not tending the gardens. They're not cleaning the that's right. 50 bathrooms or that. They, they have a, a, a phalanx of servants and groundskeepers and cooks and butlers and what have you to That's do right. that. So, so the idea yeah. of hospitality, hospitality is kind of written into their spirit of place. So it's, um, it's all about being received as a guest. But it, but it is interesting because it does, it does again, play against people's assumptions or presumptions. You know, I'm, I'm going to this fancy house on the North Shore, and I'm going to hear all about the rich people who built it and did it. And and of course, that is part of the story, but that's not the only part of the story. Like yeah. that's that story can only really work if you have this other part, if you have upstairs and downstairs to make it work. Right. Right. Yeah. No. That's 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 cool. I mean, maybe there's something inherent in finding the spirit in the place in pushing past people's assumptions, presumptions yeah. to, to find that spirit of the place. It, it is, you know, uh, um, outwardly and very intentionally, you know, trying to shift a little bit of a mindset or, a, or an assumption. Um, so, you know, you have to do the work to, to predict what those assumptions might be and then intentionally kind of rub up against that, be a little bristly with intent. Sub subvert them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, to be, it's, to be yeah. provocative, to be provocative. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, uh, well, that's that. I think that's a. I think that's a, a a very meaty takeaway there. That not you know not only this sort of shift from a sense of place to spirit of place, but this idea of okay, how how do you become provocative? How do you be? How do you push past people's assumptions to? really help them find a meaningful way to connect with the spirit of the place yeah. and not yeah. just sort of sleepwalking through a tour of yet another fancy rich person's house and you know like okay yeah like you said oh yeah this this is sort of like the house i saw in newport or the north yeah. shore of long island or what have you you know and the, and the fact that the you know the term spirit of place comes out of the um Oh gosh, I can't think of the organization, but we'll we'll, again, we'll put it in the links below, as they but say. It, but it, you know, but it is it is the um, you know the equivalent of the the historic trust um, in the UK. So it is really associated with historic properties. So you know the idea of what is the equivalent of a spirit of place when you're not working with a historic home or an estate or you know a a, a built. Um, uh, a built structure. Um, yeah, but if when, you when you're in a but gallery, if, when you're in a gallery, you know how do you how do you capture some sense of sense of place? Well, I was gallery? I was good, just going to go back to you mentioned Muir Muir Woods uh, earlier in the conversation. I mean, I I think you certainly could help people connect to the spirit of the place of a, of a completely net, you know, a, a noteworthy natural place, mm -hmm. the Grand Canyon, Muir Woods, you know, so that again, it's not just, or you even mentioned the Lincoln Memorial. I think about the first time I went to the Lincoln Memorial, Washington DC with my family. And, you know, obviously as a school kid, I had seen pictures of the Lincoln Memorial on TV or in school books or on think, the back of a five think we know back, what of it looks a, like. back of a five dollar uh -huh. bill. But when you are standing there yeah. in front yeah. of that giant statue of Lincoln and you're in this very impressive building and other people are there and you sort of are like, whoa, like this person was, you know, literally they are a giant sized figure in this in this. French sculpture, but you know there there is a very strong sense and spirit of place inside that building that can never. I mean, mm -hmm. you could never capture that even in a 
uh, virtual reality, holographic, digital, what have you, you know, yeah. you have to be standing there. So um, I, I just think, you know, in the same way, having been to Muir Woods also, you know, Muir Woods is like this outdoor cathedral. It's just sort of like, wow, yeah. look at these yeah. gigantic trees and everything that is, that forms this ecosystem here. So I've been really thinking about what is the equivalent of that spirit of place in something where a sense of place is less inherent, you know, like a, like a gallery in a natural history museum, you know, it's a vanilla box before we populate it with collections and interactive elements and audiovisual projections. And, you know, it could, if, if the building itself doesn't have inherent character, like, you know, like the, like our, you know, National Museum or like, you know, the aforementioned uh, Field Museum, you know, there's, there's some architectural character in those buildings. But what if you're, you know, what if it really is just a vanilla box? And how do we bring in, you know, a sense of, a sense of, of encounter that is extraordinary and memorable? I think that's really what we are after as exhibit planners, interpretive planners and designers is something that is memorable and you know seats itself in the long-term memory as a a special encounter and i i don't hear that word encounter enough in the dialogue you know what we, we talk a lot about what are the learning aims what what do we want people to, to take away what are the what are the wows but you know um we we sometimes build those wow we attempt to build those wows out of uh, you know, artificial means. Whereas, you know, I think people, especially, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, especially post pandemic, I think, you know, much the way that people are going to want to return to restaurants and be waited on and have beautiful food brought in front of them. I think people, when we do have a chance to return to the museum buildings, I think the encounter along with the social aspects of visiting a museum is what people are going to be craving. They're going to want to see those special things that museums well keep. i i agree with that a hundred percent i think it's also interesting you use the word character uh you know in an architectural sense but i you know you mentioned the city museum and uh i think you know i think when people sometimes uh describe the original exploratorium yeah you you know they i maybe one of the best descriptions I ever heard somebody use about the original Exploratorium was, well, it felt like you had walked into Frank Oppenheimer's workshop and he had just stepped out for a minute. You know, he wasn't there yeah. right now. Yeah. And the same thing, you know, Louis Armstrong House or the City Museum, there really is a sense, even if the person isn't physically there now, there is a sense that there is there was some human activity and some human decisions and if you want a character in a different word like there were some characters who were in this space mm -hmm. so even if it was the equivalent of a warehouse you there's still something that gives you a sense of this human well, imprint this this back to the spirit again and it triggers how you how you behave and how you um, set up your own expectations. You know, I'll use the restaurant analogy again. Like think of going into a restaurant and you see white tablecloths and formally dressed wait staff and you see crystal glasses and you see all the silverware matches and there's soft lighting and there's soft music. You're automatically, you're going to lower your voice. You're going to expect to pay more. You're going to expect I'm gonna, to- I'm going to say, I must be in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to expect smaller portions. You know, there's going to be a tremendous amount of expectation because your eyes have cast across this environment of this restaurant. And then think of another restaurant where you go in and the and the um, the band is is rocking on the stage. There are burgers being served in plastic baskets with you know with wax paper liners. You're going to eat off of a plastic fork, and you know all of a sudden you're going to pay less money. You're going to raise your voice. You're going to let your hair down. You're going to be way more casual. Um, so I think, ex I think exhibits do exactly the same thing. You know, the built, the built museum environment is exactly the same, you know, offers the same kind of clues. So when we're 
when we are designing spaces, we want to we want to capture inherently in the design expression. How do we want people to feel and behave and alter their way of being while they are here? So the classic original um, exploratorium, yeah, you could you could run as a child. You could run down those steps. You could run the length. <laughs> You could, there were there were there were exhibit developers walking their dogs exactly, and riding a bike. Exactly, and then you know, and then think of something like really, really uh, think of a very formal science center. Um, well, or the Louvre. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, all of those things we, you know, of course, we we bring into play in order to influence how we want people to feel and and what sense of place we want to portray. Well, I, uh, I love that you uh, finished by talking about the comparison uh, between restaurants and <laughs> cultural institutions, because that leaves me an opportunity to say that you've left us good food for thought, <laughs> and, and, and uh, the time has galloped away from us here, but yeah, I, I really... really I really enjoyed uh, our conversation. And I think there are some really good takeaways about what I'm now gonna characterize rather than the sense of place, the spirit of the place. And uh, that's, a, that's a good takeaway for me as I, as I think about my continuing practice. So um, Matt, thank you so much for sure. taking the time. I really appreciate it. As we mentioned several times, we will, since we are in YouTube land, we will include links and references to things we included uh, below in the description. So um, yeah, Matt, great. I, 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 this is, uh, uh, I, I'm sure we will both leave uh, our, this conversation thinking about uh, the, the spirit of places. And if not that, uh, when we will be able to go to a place with a, a good hamburger that we can, right. <laughs> that we can enjoy. Yeah. So well, thanks. Thanks Paul. Thanks for the, uh, both the provocation and the opportunity. Been, yeah, been, no, that's great. great. Thanks a lot.